Really? Well, no, yeah. well I, 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 I wouldn't be me if I didn't. See, yeah. look at Travis. He's, he's got the Henry Clay behind yeah. him, which is great. You know? Travis, know. He looks like he's taking over the uh, presidency of Altadis USA. Well, I, I've got, <laughs> all it is is a backdrop, and I've got like six of them on my floor in this little <laughs> tiny room. <laughs> so, so this is basically a floor mat is what you're saying, Travis. Yeah, I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to be coy with us. I mean, we're, uh, we shoot straight from the hip. You know, I'm not going to say it is or it isn't. Uh, you know, it works. It works. Did I fool you? All right. Well, let's let's get down to business here. So, hey, how you doing, everybody? This is Rick from Tobacco Grove coming to you with another Cigars from Afar segment. And today, we are joined with Travis and Scott, who are from Altidus, USA. Uh, Travis, how is everything? Scott? Hi, everything is great. Thank you for having us on. This is uh, it's quite an honor to be on, on your podcast or your show here on Facebook. We don't really know what it is, honestly. This is just kind of a thing. It's an entity, an electronic entity. Um, we're proud to have it. We've seen you guys have done other stuff too, but uh, it's a really a pleasure to, to see you guys again. Wish it was in person, but unfortunately, virtually we'll have to do for what we're doing right now. Um, Scott, I wanted to ask you, tell me a little bit about, kind of touch on the brief history of uh, – what Altadis is as, a, as an organization, uh, for a lot of people who don't know, um, obviously people in the industry do know, but for consumers that don't really know what Altadis is, kind of like a brief, brief history of what that company really is. Sure, sure. Uh, thanks, Cole. And uh, thanks for having us, uh, Cole and Rick. But uh, yeah, I'll touch on some of that. And then uh, Travis, the reason I wanted to bring him into the conversation is because besides his wealth of knowledge, with his title as our national education manager, he has a lot more insights and background than I do with how often he gets to go to our factories. But to your point, Cole, yeah, the name of our company is called Altidus USA, or some people may pronounce it Altadis. Still means the same thing. And we are a, a manufacturer, not a distributor of cigars. And we have uh, two factories, uh, one in the Dominican Republic and another in Honduras, which we will elaborate more on uh, as we go. And uh, some of the brands in our portfolio are more well known to people and cigar uh, fans than the name of our company. So Monte Cristo, uh, one of the most recognizable and iconic cigars in the world is uh, number one. We call that our luxury brand. Uh, Romeo and Julieta is another one that uh, many, many people have had uh, the enjoyment of smoking. And um, H. Upman, is uh, another one of our big three core brands besides uh, Aging Room. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm personally based out of the uh, same state as you guys are. You're in my backyard, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Right. And I, I cover six states in the Midwest and I've been with the company for 18 years. And uh, it's true without sounding too cliche-like. And if you love what you do, as you guys do as well, you won't work a day in your life. There's a lot of truth to that. We, we make the uh, stuff look easy out front, as you guys know, and uh, we do a lot of work behind the scenes that people don't see, which is fine. Well, that's funny but, because, Scott, you, you, you had mentioned you've been there for 18 years, and for people that don't know, that's, that's an eternity in the, in the cigar industry. So Scott is actually one of our oldest and longest, if not the oldest and longest tenured uh, cigar rep that we even have. So Scott's been around for, oh, you know, Back since the, what was it, uh, War of uh, 1812? Was it? <laughs> I think he was right before the Civil War. Scott wasn't enlisted. He was a, uh, <laughs> he was a seamstress, I believe. That's, I had a, <laughs> started, that's I how he made the hat. That's the hat. I had, it, I took, had a, that took 100 years to get the hat right. Yeah. Yep. I, I had a corn on my foot and I was discharged. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Travis, now you're located down in Florida, then, correct? I am. I am located down in Florida. Tell us a little and bit about your, what you do then, basically. I'm the uh, national education manager. And, and if you guys can explain exactly what that is, please do. Uh, but what, what I really tell everybody is, look, I, I'm the biggest cigar nerd in the company. And I love the process, anywhere from seed to finished product, how to sell it on the shelf, uh, give training advice, what the mind does as a buyer, as a consumer, to really influence the buy and finding what they're really looking for, the consumer. Um, but everything in the middle, I've gotten real involved in the, our, our tours, 
We've got a tour in Connecticut every year. Uh, we're just about ready to start our eighth year, hopefully, if everything goes well in August. And then we just did our premiere in um, Honduras. And that was a trip we went down just before all this, uh, this COVID-19 mm-hmm. issue started happening. So, yeah, we've been, we've been doing the, the tours, and it, it's been a blast. Getting back to my roots, you know, being, I grew up in the farms back in Washington State. So it was nice to get that. I can wear the boots in the office. Now I don't look, get looked at funny. Um, so, you know, I spend a lot of time on the farms. So, That's awesome. so Travis, tell everybody the name of the tour in Connecticut, because Cole and I were just on yeah. that this past year. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah, remember that. And you guys, yeah, we had a great time. You guys oh, really so made it a fun time. I'll show some videos of that or, or not. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe <laughs> but it's, not. Uh, We'll omit the one where the seeds didn't make it into the uh, into the potty seat. <laughs> that will be it. Uh, we'll omit that one. But tell us about the relationship you have with the Gershel family and with Gershel Farms. You know what are what they really do. I know that's that's the tour we went on with you guys and saw the beautiful fields and everything out there with Rod Luke. So yeah, the, the Gershel Farms is a farm that we bought years ago. Uh, we're, we're talking almost twenty five years ago. We took over the farm uh, when Gershel had to step away. And we assumed the, one of the oldest farms still in working operation today. We're the only manufacturer that still owns land in Connecticut and grows their own tobacco used in all their premium cigars. So like the Henry Clay and Yeho, when we had that cigar line out, we use that. Uh, anything that has a broadleaf wrapper is coming from our farm. So uh, it, it's quite an honor to say that we are working on the Gershel farm. If, you, if somebody from around that area, if you happen to run into them outside, the immediate farming area, and they say, oh, where's the farm at? You say, oh, it's Gershel Farms out in Innsfield. They go, oh, you know, it's, everybody knows that property. It's been around forever. Mm-hmm. And it's That's really, really farm. cool. The, the, you know, a lot of times we've been to different cigar factories, you know, in Honduras, Dominican Republic, et cetera. And to go to Connecticut, you know, and then when you, when you go to these other factories, there's a, there's a different feel, there's a, there's a different vibe. But when you go to Connecticut in the United States, and it's, it's going back to that little world. When you go back to the farm, you get that same sense yeah. that you find down in Honduras, that you find in the Dominican Republic in that little small area. And it's, it's so neat to see. It's really cool. There's a tranquility to it, absolutely. The kind of the calmingness of it. You don't get in Latin America. You just don't. It's just, it's home. It's, it's nice not having to have a passport to go see it either. But it's, <laughs> you get to see the old history of, of you know, in a state that a lot of people may not be able to step into. Well, we, we didn't want to, when you go down to a factory, you're there to see rolling, you're there to see the, the, the construction of it and the fermentation and possibly the other entities that go into the manufacturing of it. And when they invite people to come down, they are there to entertain. Sure. When I bring you out to the farm, I'm there to basically let you live that, that farm and life and, and what it's like. Because it hasn't changed in you know, thousands of years. Right. It's, it's done the same now as it was when it was coming out of Holland before it came into the Connecticut River Valley. And that's what, the, bless you, Scott. And Excuse that's me. where they're getting the tobacco, or the, they, they started growing for it, was the Dutchman that came over from Holland um, and, and Netherlands. They came over into the Connecticut region, and that's how they brought their tobacco with them and started growing in Connecticut River Valley. Awesome. Can you so we just try to give you more of a farm experience. Can you tell us uh, specifically, Travis or Scott, what, uh, is there any specific cigars that, that we may have in, in the, in the Altidus line, the humidor, that specifically come from, from that spot right there in Connecticut? Any of the specific tobacco to any specific cigars? Well, you've got one in your hand right now. So good. It's stealing my thunder. He's shamelessly <laughs> promoting. Yeah, he's shamelessly. He, he, he doesn't Listen, have the knife, though. I, I am an admitted, I was not a Henry Clay fan, okay? And I've had two Henry Clay cigars that have absolutely knocked my socks off. Um, the one was, Scott, one you gave me, that little Rothschild that, that yep. uh, had some, some serious age on it, and that was spectacular. Old school. The, yeah. the yeah, original and, yellow broadleaf, yep. Yeah. yeah. And then this one here, the Henry Clay Warhawk, which... I cannot recommend this cigar high enough. This is such a great cigar to start off your day. Um, just it, very clean all around. It's a great cigar. Tell us, tell us a little bit about the cigar. Go for it, Scott. 
Well, Henry Clay is one of the <laughs> oldest cigar brands out there. Um, my my little uh, trivia to it is it's the only cigar brand, not size, but brand that's named after a U.S. politician. And uh, Henry Clay was a state senator from Kentucky. And uh, the Warhawk was created because as a state senator, he was always up for a fight, not necessarily physically, but um, verbally, you know, with his political opponents as well. He, and that's what a war hawk is, is, is uh, the definition of war hawk, always ready to go to war, go to battle. And um, yeah, to your point, Rick, that is a really, really nice cigar. I mean, we have uh, the uh, Henry Clay stock cut that's a little bit beefier, you know, different time of day for some people. Um, and the original Henry Clay, one of the original Connecticut broadleaf wrappers out there that's toothy and veiny and most cigars aren't even the same shape, which makes it even more interesting and appealing to me. And yeah, uh, the one that I brought you and Cole a few months back just as a little gift because that's I know that you guys would appreciate something like that. Oh, a yeah. lot of age on it, some good plume. But uh, the Warhawk and uh, Travis just did a Instagram live with uh, one of our chain account managers yesterday, the day before, I don't recall Travis uh, with Tim Persons, but um, oh, yeah. Tra Travis had an interesting note on not necessarily all people go with the same spectrum of starting with something either mild to medium mm. in the morning and get fuller bodied in the afternoon. Travis, would you touch on that real yeah. quick about the Henry Clay Warhawk? It's a good point. Yeah, the, the, the Henry Clay Warhawk, if you, if you actually looked at that cigar, and I wish I, had, I had, was prepped, I could have grabbed one. Well, here, um, but, here you go. We can just do a little, little flyby <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> you got a smoke but, trip, like how you did that. That's pretty good there, Vanna White. I can't cut the wrapper off of it. Ah, and that's what I was looking ah. to do. If you actually did take, your, take a cutter and you were to cut just a, just, you know, just a little bit of that, that wrapper off the end, you'll see that it's not only got an Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper on it, making it different than all the other Henry Clays out there. They're using a great broad leaf wrapper. Very, very full, rich flavor out of it, right? Connecticut's are typically a little more delicate in the flavor, but they, they're, they're very clean. Well, if you actually take part of that wrapper off, you'll see there is a Connecticut broad leaf underneath that. We're using a Connecticut broad leaf as the binder, and it took us years to put that cigar together because we, we couldn't get that binder to work right. And what I mean by that is sure. you don't want your binder to be thicker than your wrapper. Mm -hmm. It burns slow. Then you have some issues with, with the way it burns. A lot of times they'll start to banana peel off. It's just, I mean, it's just like the thing will just peel away on you. Um, and so by going through and, and letting it ferment longer and actually thin down the leaf, we were able to get it to where we like it. And uh, it, it was a, a wonderful success knowing that we could do a Connecticut shade which is different than all the others, kind of rebelling against itself. Sure. And you still using the, the flavoring and kind of the heritage of the, that broadleaf in there. That's awesome. Now this came out, uh, what was it, uh, two years ago or one year ago? This was recent. This was two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. It was about two years ago. Because I remember they had the nice special uh, gift packs this past year. They had the, the, the knife in it and everything like that. That was really cool. Too. Yeah, something different as far as an accessory uh, versus your typical cutter or lighter that you see in a lot of gift packs, uh, doing something different like that. Um, but uh, to your point earlier, Rick, I've been with the company so long because besides loving what I do and for the company that I do it with, we've got such a large portfolio of cigars that I never get bored or burnt out because just like the wine industry, there's always something new coming out. And it keeps me learning all the time too. And when I do staff trainings or do in-store events, I learn things from the customers attending these or the staff with some of the feedback or questions that I get from them. So I'm humble enough to know and say, I don't know everything. I'm always willing to learn, including from you guys. I tell people all the time, and this is no BS, you guys are some of the most knowledgeable people in a cigar shop. Mm -hmm. And I cover six states, so I see a lot of uh, cigar bars and cigar premium tobacconist. I mean, kudos to you with how much you guys know. And I've seen you guys work the events that we've done together. Man, oh man, you guys make my job easy. And as many years as I've been in the industry, we, we always tell our, everybody that, we, that works within our company, it's you can never stop learning and you can't right. stop listening to your customers. You, you need to listen to them. 
with it, you guys are you guys are invaluable. You hear what the consumers are wanting, at least from our from from where I'm at. You guys listen to what they want. We need to listen to you and start bringing the stars out that that the actual customers are looking for. So you have the knowledge, you have the experience to for us to listen to. So we we are find you guys invaluable. That we think you guys are they're great because we can build what you guys want. Well, I appreciate that. I know you're not talking about. Uh, I know you're not talking about me, but I still appreciate it. Anyway. Um, but just to finish up on this Henry Clay real quick, the, the one of the yeah. coolest things I think about when with this cigar is that it's an it's a relatively inexpensive cigar, and it does not smoke like an inexpensive cigar at all. I think this is a, a very very good value to anybody looking for something that is a, a little bit on the milder but has immense flavor to it in the humidor at a really good price you know this is this is just a great cigar sorry i'm, I'm done with my love affair now i'm just gonna enjoy it so i know what to get you for christmas <laughs> get him a warhawk get him a blanket with a warhawk so he can snuggle with it yeah. <laughs> i want to ask you guys about uh rafael nodel and uh aging room obviously you guys got the number one cigar of the year as a company, uh, for a lot of people who don't know, uh, who is Rafael Nodal and what does it mean to have that uh, aging room Nicaragua uh, kind of gracefully at number one, uh, top 25 in cigar aficionado and kind of what that means to you guys as well. Do you, do you want me to tell you Rafael's version or my version? <laughs> Your version. version. Of the pair. <laughs> We've got time. We've got time. Because if we tell Rafael's version, I just came up on a little boat and then his stories are great, but they're long. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the uh, the the cigar itself was in a, an extension of the regular Quattro line. We decided to build the Quattros instead of calling it the F55 or the F55M. We took those and said we were going to make a series called Quattro. Um, and by doing that, we had the Quattro original, which was the F55. The F55M became the Maduro, creating and, and this is Raphael that's doing this. It, sure. He created the, the Connecticut version, still using the same manufacturer that's building the original and the Maduro. And then he went to his friends in Nicaragua and he went to AJ and said, I want to build one off of this Quattro line. And between him and AJ, they built that cigar. And he really built that off of his love for the Cuban heritage that sure. he comes from and AJ's heritage. So they decided to do that together with that in mind. What, what happens with, this is something I think maybe some people find interesting to consumers, and, and maybe this is a better question for Scott, but what happens when a cigar gets rated Cigar of the Year, right, by Cigar Aficionado, which is one of the, if not the largest publication for cigars out there, um, right. what happens to a company? What happens to you guys? What all of a sudden goes down where it's like, because obviously the, you know the demand is going to go through the roof. You know, what happens behind the scenes that maybe some people don't get to see, but all the inner workings of how that comes about? Uh, total chaos. Thanks for asking. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> well, we they, do that, but they don't know. That. <laughs> they, you know, we were told, uh, you know, the manufacturer or the blender of a cigar that gets the number one rating, they don't get any heads up from Cigar Aficionado ahead of time to amp up supply, which is unfortunate. So to your point, Rick, yeah, the demand just goes out the roof and the uh, back orders begin actually before the actual magazine is, you know, on the streets, it's the online version with a top 25 that, you know, your real, you know, cigar nerds go to first and start buying up this stuff. But, but it's fun. I mean, this is the first time in the 18 years I've been with the company that we've had the number one um, cigar. We've had the number two cigar, uh, Romeo by Romeo, uh, mm -hmm. back in 2012. Um, and we've had, uh, last year we had, um, our Monte Cristo Nicaraguan, which was another collaboration with AJ Fernandez, was a top 10 cigar. This year, we actually had two in the top 10, besides being fortunate enough to have the number one cigar of the year. Our H. Upman 175th anniversary cigar was uh, rated number 10 of the year, too. So that was a great a, one, too. <laughs> it is. I, I tell people, and it was available. Uh, it's a limited edition. We still have uh, some inventory on it, but it is available in a Churchill size only. Um, 
I love box press cigars myself personally. There's just something about it. I tell people, and I'm not afraid to say so, that when I think box press, the first thing that comes to mind is Padron. Yep. And you don't hear too many people say a bad thing about a Padron cigar that, that they've had you know, recently or over the years. And I'm in that group. I, I love Padron cigars. But um, yeah, it, uh, H up in 175th yes. anniversary is like a big stick of chocolate, a big long stick of chocolate, dark chocolate is how I explain it to people. Yeah, and there's, it's interesting because when you have something like the cigar of the year that happens to you, it can be this great blessing, but you're right, a lot of people don't see all the stuff behind the scenes and how chaotic and crazy. Yeah. What, I, what I like about it is that, you know, when, because everybody smoked a Padron, right? Everybody smoked a regular Monte Cristo, right? What I like about it is that it gets that cigar into people's hands who haven't had that experience yet. And they smoke it because we've seen it here at the store. They light it up and they right. go, whoa, this is really good. And then all of a sudden, this becomes a pull product where instead of, you know, us having to say, tell them all about it, all of a sudden they're like, no, 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 I really like that cigar. Can I get a box of it now? You know, yeah. it's like, well, <laughs> we'll try. But, the, you know, the, the production is yeah. kind of tight on this right now because everybody wants it, right? Yeah, I was really yep. surprised when I smoked that aging room. It was uh, that one is by far the best one that I like. There's other ones that I like, like the Solera line and everything else, but that the Nicaragua one had almost everything from my profile palette that I like. Just a ton of flavor, above medium, not overwhelming. But it was just what was crazy to me is it had it was front loaded to have it, and it was ridiculously smooth all the way through for about three quarters through that cigar and every single person said the same thing. They were just dumbfounded how smooth yeah. that cigar was all the way through as an experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know they built that cigar based off of the flavor as opposed to like the, the big body level. Like we, you guys probably hear it in the shop, you know, what kind yeah. of cigar are you looking for today? It's like, Oh, something with body. Like, really? Sure. You're really looking for flavor. And that's what Raphael and AJ, AJ put together on that. And uh, spin back real quick on, on what Scott was saying. When we find out number one cigar of the year, it's, it's literally, you see us in the office going, has anyone seen the posting yet? Because you, you go on and they'll tell you when it's supposed to be released. As soon as we found out, yeah, we had, uh, I believe it was two weeks before oh. the factory shut down for the year or, you know, for the rest of the year. They closed down for a month and a half. That's right. So now we, we find out two weeks later, the factory shut down for a month and a half. We, you, you, as manufacturers, we all are faced with the same problem. Uh, we, we try and get them out. We try and get more manufactured without jeopardizing the quality, but uh, it, it's chaotic. It, it, it's a complete show before Christmas. I can only imagine. That's crazy. That's crazy. Is there any upcoming projects you guys have coming up that uh, got stuff in the works we're looking forward to? I, I know they can't see. Oh, there they go. And people got a, a little quick little. Oh, oh yeah. Romeo Nicaragua? Oh, I saw it. I, I may have, I saw may have it. seen yeah. that. You know, no. yeah, that's, you know what? that's go ahead, Travis. Yeah, I, I know you, Scott, you haven't had a chance to try it yet. You just got your box in the mail yesterday, yep. and it was what last night, like 29 degrees. Yeah, 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 it's cold up here in Minnesota. That was the temperature, that wasn't the real feel. <laughs> There's a difference, just like body and strength in a cigar. Same thing yeah. with weather up here in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. No, Travis knows about that. He he lived in Colorado for quite a few years before he transferred down to corporate headquarters down in Fort Lauderdale there. So um, he's well aware of that stuff. But one thing I wanted to mention about, um, you know, the aging room brand and, and that kind of stuff is it put us in the conversation of uh, more of the boutique category. And that's a huge category in our industry. You guys, as you guys know, Absolutely. you know, uh, people... Some people may look at some of our more well-known names as far as Monte Cristo, Romeo, H. Upman as, you know, maybe the Budweiser or Miller, if that's a correct oh. analogy. And then when we started doing collaborations with the Placencia family over the last few years and A.J. Fernandez and now bringing in Rafael Nadal Sr. into our house and all of his different projects, it kind of gives us better street cred or more street cred in that boutique area. And, and that's fun. That's a fun uh, category to be in. I agree with you a hundred percent. I think mm -hmm. that you'll see a lot of times where everybody knows. I mean, I, I, in, in all honesty, the cigar that most people talk about when they walk in the humidor who don't know anything about cigars at all is Romeo and Juliet. 
That's that's right. the number yeah. one. Number two would be Cohiba that we hear from. I know you're the dark side, right? Um, yeah. And then and and then the, the third one is Monte Cristo. But these are uh, these are iconic names of cigars, right? Right. And and you're absolutely right. You know, doing something with aging room. You know, you guys had one, the Henry Clay with uh, Pete Johnson, right? Uh, yeah, the tattoo. The tattoo. Yeah, the tattoo as well. You know, and I think that's good because it, it does it gets it out to it's a cigar that, you know, maybe people say, well, you know what, this is newer. It's new to me, that kind of thing. Right. Right. So I, I kind of went through my, um, sales presenters going back through the last couple of years. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, what, what brands did we collaborate with, with the Placencia family and, uh, AJ Fernandez. So with the Placencia family, we started with the uh, Romeo 505 with the orange and black band and box. That and is the Nicaraguan. That I, was, yeah, uh, that I was choosing between that and this, and I had to go with this. Yeah, Nicaraguan Puro. And jokingly in my travels, I've got a name for everything, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner cigars. Mm -hmm. Well, the Romeo 505 is my Juicy Lucy. And mm -hmm. people in Minnesota can refer to that with the, that burger. Yeah. But it's just full of flavor without being overpowering. And to Travis's earlier point, it doesn't have to be strong and overpowering to be a good cigar. People are looking for a lot of flavor. Right. And sometimes they don't know how to express that or they're just not um, educated enough to um, know that. Well, Scott, you, you mentioned this earlier to Travis. You were talking about how I had mentioned that this is a great cigar for me to start off my day, right? But you had right. mentioned that not everybody wants to do that. They want to, you know, some guys want to start off something strong. Tra uh, Travis, what have you found with that? I, I find just the opposite, personally. And I, I just found out uh, Mr. Tim Persons with our company is very much like that, the way I am. I have sleep apnea real bad, and not, not saying, oh, poor as woe as me, because I've had it my whole life, just means I snore like a banshee. Uh, but it, it's, when I wake up in the morning, I need to wake up. So the nicotine on the full-bodied cigars, because that's all body is, is nicotine, it, it, when I get that first thing in the morning, that wakes me up. It gets my heart rate going, but on the flip side, when I have my final cigar of the evening, I don't really want my heart racing because I'm eventually going to want to fall asleep. So I do my mellows. Now, there is a little bit of a transition when it comes to your, your palate. because You've got to learn in between cigars as you're decelerating. Sure. You, need to, you need to clean your palate out and learn what can really scrape those oils off, that, off your palate to, to open the flavors back up. And just to, to point out what I was showing you earlier. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, nice. so, mine, anyway. Travis, mine just looks like this though right now. That's that's all mine looks like. So. I'm jealous. <laughs> I am <laughs> jealous. That's why I mean, that was yours, but you know, his is better. <laughs> but that's a great it, point, it, Travis, that you brought up is that most people, it seems like at least here, kind of start to think of you start mild, you end up, sure. you know, strong at the, at the end. And it's, mm. it's, you're right. There are people that do that. You know, you just, mo most people think the opposite, but, uh, but I agree with you. Well, and remember, it's not about us. It's, it's right. too many people listen to everybody and think, oh, I've got to follow the herd. Mm -hmm. I, 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 if anyone knows me, they know I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do that. That's the way I am. And I believe people should be like that with their cigars because, remember, when you buy that cigar, you fire it up, you're the only one smoking it typically. So sit back, enjoy that cigar. You, it's about you and that cigar at that point in time. Yeah. If you like doing full bodies in the morning and going to mild, okay. Yeah. If you like cutting your cigar with, with your fingernail, you know, you can just, just clip it off with your fingernail, and, and you, you love doing it that way. Hey, have at it. Right. You have to use cedar to, to light your cigar for the first time because it's the romance of, of doing it that way. By all means, I would never deny you if that's what you like to do. Sure. There are sometimes better ways of doing it, and there's logic and, and science behind why you, you may or may not want to do something. But hell, it, enjoy your cigars, man. Life's too short. That's true. You're finding out. That's true. There's so many different ways. I mean, different cuts that people like, you know, et cetera, different ways of lighting it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's so cool about cigars is at the end of the day, it's a cigar. But what I find fascinating, and, and maybe, Travis, you can speak to this a little bit, is most people don't realize – 
when they go to that cigar shop and, you know, they come in here to Tobacco Grove and they pick out a cigar and they cut it right away. You know, I've even seen some guys bite the end off it, you know, which I cringe, but, uh, but hey, it's their cigar, right? Um, and they light it up and they just smoke through it and they just power through that thing. Um, I guess what I'm talking about here is so many people don't realize what goes into bringing that cigar to them right? There's so many processes that have to happen. There's so much quality control. There's so many literally hands that touch that tobacco. And a lot of times we just take it for granted. We just pick it up, cut it, light it, and it's, it's just a cigar to us. But there is, it's an art form. Am I right? A hundred percent. I One of the, my strongest feelings, when I, when I fell in love with, with cigars, it was a competitive cigar company. I'm not going to say that because I wasn't in the industry at the time. I'd never smoked a cigar before. But he's, this, this gentleman spent two and a half hours with me, taught me about the romance of what a cigar is. Not so much getting into the technicals of here's how you cut it and light it and here's the, how you, the wrapper binder filler. and all. He just told me the stories about what cigars are and why, why do we smoke cigars? Then I smoked my cigar, first cigar with him. And we just had a great conversation to where it got to me to, to fall in love with him. So much that I got married in the Dominican Republic. I, I asked my wife to marry me in the Dominican Republic. I, when I lived in Colorado, I used to grow tobacco in pots, like literally just a pot, you know, the big ones. Sure. Um, but I'd grow to, a, a tobacco in those pots. I would take them to one of the big shows that I go to in the fall, uh, in August, out in, in Boulder, Colorado, and I would give those away. And I just wanted to bring them so people could touch them. Sure. But, the, I mean, the, I forgot where you were going with what your question was, but uh, I got you off a little it, tangent. You hit it on the head. You talked about the romance of the yeah. cigar and that so many people don't realize what goes into it before they get to it. And, and it is an art form. I mean, I could bore you with the, with the you know, six – eight weeks in the greenhouse, eight weeks in the field, eight weeks in the curing burn, two weeks in the harvest. There's a half a year just in the growth of the tobacco. Then you got your fermentation, which is basically baking the tobacco um, under natural decomposition, create heat source that heat can't get out. So create heat. That could be anywhere from nine months to three years, depending on, on where we're getting the tobacco off of the plant because it all sure. different levels will, will require more fermentation. Then you've got, at least a minimum, uh, at minimum, two years of aging. So think about just the tobacco right now. Uh, we just started putting the seeds into the seed beds out in Connecticut. And that's our planning for that. And I think we're doing 104 acres this year. But we had to plan that number of acres based off of what we're looking to project five years from now. So we have to, we have to start growth for a five-year projection of what we're going to need for current and possibly new executions and uh, going down can, the road. You can grow in Connecticut year round. Is that and not, not grow, but you can maintain that tobacco year round. Is that correct? Well, what do you mean by maintain? Well, I remember when we were there, we, there were some greenhouses and, and there was the ability to still grow in there, even though it was going to be cold outside, et cetera. You still had the ability to have production there, even in the dead of winter. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, when we do work out of Connecticut now, it's so far north that you do have to kind of start early and sure. you got to fudge at the end uh, toward the back end of it because you've only got so much time. So we, yes, we do our greenhouses are temperature controlled. Uh, so they've got heaters. They, we don't, we throw ACs in there because we don't need it that time of year during that eight weeks of, of uh, the sprouting process. But uh, we do have heaters to help maintain temperatures in there, make sure the ground is thawed out. So we'll fire those up usually two weeks before we get ready to, to lay seeds in. And then we also have water in there to make sure we have a, a regular watering source. Because we, we, when we put seeds in the seed pods in those 96 trays, we want to make sure we get as close to a 95% growth rate out of each of those trays. We don't want to lose but one every two trays, maybe two you start losing more than that, then, then you need to start thinking, how can I do things different? Cause it's all about money and time. 